I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that we started the week last Sunday with Matt reminding us about Jesus' I am statement, reminding us that he is the light of the world, that we are children of the light, we walk in the light, and nothing can change that. And we're going to dig into more of who Jesus is today. But before we do that, come with me on a journey back to 1996, and I know some of you weren't born, but I am a tourist. And I am standing on the 107th floor of the South Tower of the World Trade Center in New York City. And I am amazed at the view. I'm watching this guy imprint uh, the... uh, imprint the Twin Towers on copper tokens that he's selling as souvenirs or giving away to those who can answer random trivia questions. To all the geography students on the top of the world today, he announces, who can name the small island state off the southeastern tip of Australia? (gasps) Me! I am Tasmanian! Tasmania! I am Tasmanian! He looks at me and says, don't give it away. And then he gives the token to this spoiled little kid from New Jersey whose parents give him the answer. I am not happy. Fast forward 20 years and I am standing on the sideline at a a second grade flag football game. I am listening to the opposing team coach complain about my kids' on-field skills and then accusing our coach of recruiting Joey away from his team. And then he says, and he's probably, he's probably not the legal age anyway, he's probably too old for second grade flag football. I finally pipe up and I said, hey mate, give it a rest. It's second grade flag football. He goes, he looks at me, he goes, well prove it. Who are his parents? I said, I am Joey's father. Okay, here's another scenario you might be uh, familiar with if you have watched kids or raised kids at any time. They're messing around in the house or somewhere. Things are going to get broken. You lay down the law and you get challenged. Well, who's really in charge here? You're not the boss of me. Well, while you're under my roof, you announce, I am in charge. I am the boss of you. Well, 20 years ago, I said I do to Mandy so that for the last two decades, I've been able to say I am her husband. I am still in love with her. I am her best friend. There are so many I am statements that attempt to define us, aren't there? And there's only one that really should for all those that have chosen to follow Jesus. And I don't, don't assume that everybody watching today or on campus here today has made that step. We're just glad you're here wherever you are on the journey. But for those of us that have chosen to follow Jesus, we can say this. I am a child of the living God. So we're in this series where we're looking at the seven I am statements of Jesus in the book of John. World changing, groundbreaking, shaking statements that answer some of life's biggest questions. Questions like, what do you really need? Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Are you tired of the darkness? Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And today we're going to ask a question that can be asked in so many different ways. Who's looking out for me, after me? Who's watching over me? Who the heck cares about me? Who's got my back? Our two boys played tackle football for the first time this year, 2020, an interesting year to start tackle. And Joey, our oldest, their team actually won the championship game last weekend, yeah. I think maybe they won it because they asked that very question before every game and every practice. Take a look. got your back I got your back so Joey played wide receiver on his team Jacob played running back on his team and there were many times their teammates had their back and there were a few ice packs and some ice baths as a result of team members not having their back so what about you on your journey who's got your back well Jesus answers that question in an amazing way in our text for today in John chapter 10. If you want to start turning there, we're going to read it together in just a moment. But first, I want to give you some context. Immediately preceding this in John chapter 9, Jesus has performed a miracle restoring sight to a blind man, restating that 
I am the light of the world, except that the Pharisees or the religious leaders of the day didn't like the way Jesus had done this miracle. Surprise, surprise. He'd performed it on the Sabbath, and so he'd done it in an unacceptable way. You see, the, the Pharisees, they worshipped the dogmatic, acceptable, containable, explainable, controllable, understandable God. Sure, we worship a God who's in control, but he's totally out of our control. Writer and speaker Sky Jathani said, as much as we might want to control God, history has proven him notoriously uncooperative. I don't want to worship a small God. But the Pharisees, they like defining God in a box and then often blocking access to him. And Jesus says a clear no in our text for today. Let's turn to John 10, verses 7 to 9. Read along if you like. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. Jesus is saying, I am the gate. I decide who's in and I'm so glad he does because he let me in. He let you and you and you and you. And he longs for you to be in and you and you and you. No matter who you are, what you've done or where you come from, Jesus longs for you to be in the fold. He describes himself as a shepherd and we as his sheep. So I grew up in a country and on an island with lots of sheep. The land of Ugg and lamb dinners. If you had to ask me what a quintessential Australian meal is, sorry to all the vegetarians, but I would tell you it's a lamb roast. Because if mum or dad are cooking a lamb roast, you cancel all of your plans. In fact, there was a... a television advertisement campaign way back in the day for the lamb industry where a young Australian woman would get this random call from Tom Cruise asking her out on a date. Well, this date's me. And she'd get crazy excited. I mean, she just got a call from Tom Cruise. And then she goes, oh, wait a minute. Oh, I can't tonight. Mum's cooking a lamb roast. You get the idea. Even today when we're at home in Australia, uh, there's a lamb roast at some point that's cooked and the extended family gathers together. I'm afraid I'm a snob in an American restaurant when lamb is on the menu. I have to ask the server, where actually is the lamb from? Because I don't want you serving me any lamb from Nebraska. Maybe Colorado, Australia, New Zealand. And then there's sheep farming in Australia. Well, that's a whole different deal. You know, I remember back in my entertainment days when I used to work at a venue where we had a glass top piano and people could sit around the piano. That's a whole other story. And one night I had two couples sitting at the piano. One couple was from London, England, a city of nine million people. The other couple was from a sheep station in Western Australia. We worked out that the sheep station was the same size in area, square miles, as London, greater London. But not nine million people lived on this sheep station. Nine people lived in the same area and 50,000 sheep. Now, when it came time to muster those sheep, click go the shears, mate, ask an Aussie what that means. When it came time to muster those sheep, it would take a week to do it. Light aircraft, motorbikes, trucks, we call them utes. And then that would equate to some of the finest wool and lamb on meal tables across Australia. I'm getting all warm and cozy and hungry just thinking about it. Maybe we're having lamb for lunch today. Well, shepherding in Jesus' day was quite different. It wasn't unusual for families to have a small amount of sheep that was a necessary and valued part of their livelihood. And they would keep these sheep in a, a fold or a pen with walls made out of rocks or shrubbery, trees, bushes. And it had neither a roof but thorns on the walls to stop thieves and robbers or an actual gate. It would just have an opening and the shepherd or watchman would sit or lie down in the opening, effectively being the gate for the sheep. So as you can see, this is powerful imagery to the people of the day. So let's unpack our text today piece by piece and explore what it tells us about who Jesus is. Starting with, very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. What does this tell us about who Jesus is? He is our access. 
He is our access to God. He has our back. Anything Jesus said or did when he walked the earth always had multi-layered meaning and often would fulfill Old Testament prophecy or passages. I mean, check this out back in, over in Numbers 27, verses 15 to 17 in the Old Testament. Moses said to the Lord, May the Lord, the God who gives breath to all living things, appoint someone over this community to go out, and come in before them, one who will lead them out and bring them in, so the Lord's people will not be like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus is saying to us here, among other things, I am that shepherd. In fact, in, in John 10, 11, he makes another bold I am statement when he says, I am the good shepherd. And we're going to unpack that in a couple of weeks. Don't miss it. But here he's saying, I am the gate. I am the entry, the exit to life in all its fullness, goodness, richness, wholeness, awesomeness, and access to God. You see, we have this picture of the shepherd sitting or lying in the entranceway, becoming the gate. Well, imagine Jesus standing with his arms open wide, giving us access to safety, peace, and security. He ultimately did this for us on the cross. And Isaiah prophesied, predicted this also in the Old Testament, Isaiah 53. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Another thing we know about sheep is this. They're not the smartest animals in the kingdom. In fact, they're among the least. Without the shepherd, they're not going to survive. Without the shepherd, we're not going to survive. I can't put it any plainer this day than to say, without Jesus, ultimately, we're not going to make it. Human nature says we will go astray. We will turn to our own way. And it's only through the grace of Jesus that we gain access to forgiveness and relationship with the Father. You see, Jesus is basically sticking it to the Pharisees in our text today when he says, you're not the gate I am. You don't decide, I do. And he's always hinting at what's to come, which no one could have imagined or fathomed. That through his death and sacrifice on the cross, he would make up the shortfall for us, bridge the gap, fill the emptiness, bridge the divide, shut the gate on death and open the doorway to life everlasting. Is that good news? Will you choose the shepherd? Will you let him be your access? Will you seek him, follow him, trust him instead of other doorways? Jesus tells us in verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. And then the next verse in our text today, he says, all who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. What does this reveal to us? It reveals that he protects us. He protects us. As the gate, the shepherd would do two profound, pretty basic things, but profound things. The shepherd would lead the sheep out and he would lead the sheep in. He would lead them out to food and pasture and nourishment. We'll talk about that in a moment. But he would lead them back in to safety, protection, security, and peace within the enclosure. Jesus, the shepherd, knows what we need. He protects us. He has our back. I looked that saying up in Urban Dictionary this week. It's saying, who's got your back? That's what it said. When someone has your back, they're there to support you unconditionally. When life seems to blindside you with undesirable events, they're there for you without complaint, supporting you in your moment of need, not for their own selfish, self-gratifying reasons, but because your well-being to them is foremost in their mind and heart. Simply stated, when someone has your back, your life is greatly enhanced. Say it in a sentence, you have some big obstacles to go through, but remember, I've got your back. Can you hear Jesus saying that to you today? We've needed to hear that more than ever this year, haven't we? Jesus used the analogy of, of thieves and robbers, also powerful in that day when it came to protecting one's sheep. Just a few verses earlier, he says, Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. 
The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. So maybe the question for us today is who and what are you letting over the wall of the sheep pen in your life? Matt touched on this a bit last week. What voice are you letting be louder in your life than the voice of the shepherd? What addictions continually come over the wall and derail your life? What scenario do you keep building in your head and always creating the worst possible scenario? Where are you truly investing your time, your energy, your resources? What voices or voice are you listening to? Jesus the shepherd protects us, but we have to listen to and recognize his voice. Back in Jesus' day, it wasn't uncommon for families with small amounts of sheep to share a sheep pen and then have a shared hired watchman to watch the sheep overnight, to watch the collective. The next day, the shepherd of the family would come back and use a a distinctive call to call out his sheep from the pen. Mate, mate, mate. I don't know whether it was like that. But I do know that this practice apparently is still used in some parts of the Middle East today. The shepherd coming with a distinctive call for the sheep. Sometimes that shepherd naming each sheep individually. We have a shepherd that has a distinctive and unique call on and in and for our lives. He knows our names, but so often we tune him out, don't we? That's why I love this challenge Max Licato gives when he writes, you gave your heart to him and your life to his work. But then came the kids, the promotion, the transfer, the long hours, the business trips. With each passing day, you thought less about God's work and more about your work. Calling became coping. Prayers became rote quotes. You didn't forget God, but you didn't remember him either. And now he's pulled you aside for a face-to-face. It's time to consider your ways. Maybe it's time to seek the voice of our shepherd again. Because listening to ourselves, well, that hasn't worked out too well. Don't listen to what other people say about you. Don't listen to what you say about you. Open the Bible and read what God says about you and what Jesus did for you. Which brings us to the next part of our text today. When Jesus restated, I am the gate. And then he said, anyone who enters through me will be saved. What does this tell us about Jesus? Well, this is the greatest news of all. He saves us. He saves us. You see, the Bible is a book from start to finish that's about restoration. The father restoring his kids to himself. Jesus seeking his sheep. The Bible tells us that you are loved. You are saved and you matter. You matter. Even when you don't feel like you matter to anyone else. The people you've let down or disappointed. The cool kids who don't want to hang out with you. The spouse who fell out of love with you. The boss who overlooked you. The parent or significant other that did something that should have never been done to you. The shepherd sees you. The shepherd loves you. The shepherd saves you. You matter. There's another powerful image of this over in Luke 15, where Jesus describing himself again as the shepherd leaves his 99 sheep in an open field to go looking for the one lost sheep. Now, this would have been shocking to to the people of the day. That's no equation. Risking 99 for one, but that's what Jesus does because you matter. And so frantically, he goes looking for that lost sheep until he finds you. And then celebrating, he puts that lost lamb around his shoulders and makes the journey back home to the herd, to the fold. You matter. And so here at LifeBridge, lost sheep matter to us. And given the choice, if we have to leave the 99 sheep that are already home, we will do it to go after the one. And if you're a part of the 99, join us as we seek out lost sheep to introduce them to the shepherd because they matter, you matter. He saves us. He saves us from ourselves because he is the great I am. Matt 
unpacked that for us beautifully in the message last week about what I am means. If you didn't see it, I encourage you to go back and watch it or listen. The I am statements of Jesus echo God's statement to Moses way back in Exodus chapter 3, early in the, the Old Testament, when he reveals himself, God reveals himself to Moses as I am who I am. Author Louis Giglio writes and heads up, these are powerful words. So let them, let them sink in in your life today. God was telling Moses, I am the center of everything. I am running the show. I am the same every day forever. I am the owner of everything. I am the Lord. I am the creator and sustainer of life. I am the title holder of the universe. I am the savior. I am the source. I am more than enough. I am inexhaustible and immeasurable. I am who I am. I am God. And in a heartbeat, Moses knew God's name. And something more, he finally knew his. For his God, if God's name is I am, Moses' name must be I am not. I am not the center of everything. I'm not in control. I'm not the source, not the solution, not all powerful. I'm not calling the shots. I'm not the owner of anything. I'm not the Lord. I am not. And that's my name too and yours. Just try it under your breath today. My name is I am not. I'm not running anything. I'm not the head of anything. I'm not in charge of anything. I'm not the maker. I'm not the savior. I'm not holding it all together. I'm not all knowing. I am not God. And sure, people may call you Tommy or Eddie or Amanda or Juan or Michelle or Aaron or Courtney. But let's face it. When you get right down to it, all our names are I am not. And God's name is still I am. And he is the only one. Who can save us? So now to the last part of our text today. Jesus said, they will come in and go out and find pasture. And what does that tell us? It tells us that our shepherd provides for us. He provides for us. Practically, he's providing for us right now. Today, he gave us another day of life. And in Matthew 6, verses 24 to 26, he says these words, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? He's asking us to trust in his provision for us today. So do not worry, he says in Matthew 6, verse 31, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about t tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You see, this I am statement we're digging into today, it's all about perspective. Perspective. Did you catch that in Matthew 6, 25, when Jesus asks, is life not worth more than food? Is it? Heck yeah. Jesus provides for us spiritual life, abundant life, eternal life. And so maybe the question we need to be asking when we're facing life's challenges is this, does it matter? Does it really matter in the light of and in comparison to spiritual life, abundant life, eternal life that he is providing for us today? He's given us today. Why worry about tomorrow? You know, in this stage of my career, I get to coach a lot of leaders. It's an honor and a privilege. I learn so much from them. I prefer to ask questions rather than give advice. But when, when I do end up needing to give advice, the most common piece I give is this. Don't react to an imagined reality. 
It's the most common piece of advice I give myself. Is what I'm lying awake at night worrying about actually happened? And in my equation of anxiety, am I factoring in that I am not, but I know I am? Jesus also reminds us in Matthew 6 to seek first the kingdom, the things that matter to God, because that's the pathway to perspective. And that's when our eyes will be open to how he is providing for us. And so here at LifeBridge, that's what we want to do as a church. We want to seek first the kingdom, the things that matter to the shepherd, and that is introducing lost sheep to him and leading them in their next step, getting that in priority with all the things he calls us to be at a church, as a church. When we do that, then he'll provide for our church. He'll guide our church. He'll lead our church. So what about you? What about you on the journey? Because each of these I am statements leads us to a decision to make and a step to take. What are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to decide to do with Jesus? Our first week we learned that he said, I am the bread of life. Last week Matt reminded us that he said, I am the light of the world. This week we're remembering he said, I am the gate, the doorway. What are you going to do with Jesus? Will you choose a shepherd? Because I am is the answer to every question. Who's looking out for me? Jesus said, I am. In the midst of the mess and stress, everything seeming so out of control right now, who is in control? Jesus says, I am. It's feeling really dark right now. Who's going to bring some light? Jesus says, I am. Who's providing for me? I am. Who's guiding me? I am. Who is left to love me? Who is thinking about me? I am. And if you can believe that with the small amount of faith you have left or to begin with, and you're anything smarter than a sheep, then you have a decision to make, a step to take, realizing there's so much at stake. It's an important question. So important that Jesus asked his own disciples. Rick reminded us of this week one of our series, John 6, 67, when Jesus said to his disciples, who do you say I am? In other words, what are you going to do with me? What are you going to decide? Are you going to follow me or are you going to leave too? Jesus is asking each of us today, who is going to follow me? I am. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for sending your son, the shepherd, our access to you and life everlasting. Our protector, our savior, our provider. And thank you for inviting us to take a next step. And maybe that next step today is inviting you into our life and committing to follow you for the very first time. If that's you, we pray this prayer this morning. God, thank you for loving me. I know that I've gone astray. I know that I need you. Lord, I invite you into my heart for the very first time. It's my Lord and Savior. I want to follow you. I believe that you died for my sins to set me free. And for others of us, maybe we've made that decision more than once in our lives, but we've drifted. We've drifted astray. And we need to recommit to following you today. And if that's you, we pray this prayer, Lord. I pray for a closer walk with you. Show me what that means today and in the coming days, weeks and months. That I may follow you and know you truly as my shepherd. God, thank you for loving us. Lord, thank you for being our shepherd. It's in your name. Amen.
So if you prayed that prayer for the first time today to invite the shepherd into your heart, Jesus into your heart, we would love to come alongside you, find somebody in a green shirt on campus or text the number on the screen. Or maybe you've prayed to walk more closely with him again, that you've drifted and you need support in that, text the number, find one of us. Whatever step you need support with, we would love to come alongside you. And right now, we're going to take a next step in our worship experience as Jesus invited us to do each time we meet. And that is to remember how much we matter to the shepherd, that he loves us. So we're going to take communion. A piece of bread representing his broken body. Go ahead and eat it during the next song. The juice representing his shed blood. Go ahead and drink that. If you're on campus, you receive the communion on the way in. Wherever you gathered at home, we invite you to take communion with us. And if you're not ready to take communion this morning, that's fine. Just reflect on the words of this song as we worship and remember that we have a shepherd. If we remember the beautiful name of Jesus.